Thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And it's a great pleasure as chairman of RUSI to add to the warm welcome to you all here at RUSI today. I hope you've had a very productive day. Uh, we are, as you know, a center of independent and innovative thinking beyond the confines of any one government department or government or country, indeed. And that has been on very uh, good display here uh, today. Um, and I hope that having this conference today has also uh, drawn further public attention to the issues, as well as you being able to have your own discussions here. Uh, certainly, it was very welcome to hear this morning the first Sea Lord on the uh, Today program of uh, Radio 4, partly because, um, if I might say so, he acquitted himself extremely well uh, on a program where it's not easy to do that, um, but also uh, because it is important that in such media the future of the Navy is discussed, which it hasn't very frequently been discussed in recent years uh, in a country which has needed an effective Navy for centuries and will continue to need an effective Navy uh, forever into the future. And you have been able to talk today about the choices faced in the future, um, the options that the military need to give to governments, uh, about how navies will fight in the future, about how to use information and artificial intelligence, about how to attract and recruit and develop uh, the right people. Uh, you've heard from the Defense Secretary, you've heard from many heads of navy from other countries, and we've had over 30 nations represented here uh, today. So it's very appropriate for this concluding session of the conference that we Listen to Sir Philip Jones, the first Sea Lord and the Chief of the Naval Staff. He's, you know that he has had uh, an extraordinary and long and successful career in the Navy. Uh, right from the, the South Atlantic on HMS Fearless in 1982 in the Falklands War, and he's served all over the world. He has commanded counter-drug uh, operations in the Caribbean and counter-piracy operations off Somalia and NATO response forces in the Baltic and many other things as well. So he brings extraordinary experience to this position and it will be a pleasure to listen to him now and then for him to take a few questions. The first Sea Lord, thank you very much. Uh, Lord Haig, thank you very much for that welcome. Um, it's a great pleasure to be culminating the day here today um, with an opportunity to put a few markers down. Um, in a previous conversation at an event here at Rusi a couple of weeks ago, Lord Haig and I discovered that we were students at Oxford at the same time. Um, this is quite a long time ago, um, but happy memories. Although our paths hadn't crossed there, and perhaps that's not surprising. Different colleges and different subjects but also, as I recall it, he was already ploughing a very powerful furrow through the Oxford Union and the Conservative Association that would culminate him in him becoming leader of the party when I was a mere commander in the Royal Navy. I was busy rowing for my college, being president of the JCR um, and preparing for my naval career. But clearly, um, about 35 years on from that moment, we've achieved our destiny by being first Sea Lord and Chairman of Rusi at the same time. So we've ended up back together again, and quite right too. Um, now, it was hard to know where to start um, when you think about how to conclude this conference um, uh, and such a valuable day of debate on the future of naval warfare. And while I was thinking about what words to use and where to draw inspiration from, I was, and this is absolutely true, I promise you, because I am a member of RUSI, was flicking through the latest RUSI journal and came across an excellent review by Christian Melby um, of Lawrence Friedman's new book, The Future of War, A History, and that title struck a chord because of what we're talking about today. Um, now, I'll confess straight up that I haven't yet read Lawrence Friedman's book. Um, more often these days in this job, I spend most of my time outside leave periods reading briefs and papers rather than reading interesting books, but I will try and read it in due course. But the review was excellent, and if it's accurate, um, then the approach that Lawrence is taking in that book is not just what the future is, but how you look at it. And I think that offers food for thought in how we try and culminate our work here today. Um, the key theme of Lawrence's study is that the study of war should not be separated from the context with which you're looking at it, the concerns of the time, as he calls it, within which war occurs. And nor, I think, can we constrain ourselves to 
the facts and figures of war. So often the focus of analysis over the last century um, attempts to quantify and measure wars which will perhaps never quite tell the entire picture of the conflict. And the world of fiction, again, um, as this book review illustrated, can often make the point really well. The 2015 novel, Ghost Fleet, uh, a novel of the next world war, you heard Peter refer to it earlier, many of you will have read it, demonstrates that a rigorously researched story can actually prove sufficiently thought-provoking such that it can help prevent the war it describes, a powerful piece of deterrence. By focusing on the issue of context, uh, Friedman managed to steer clear of predicting the incidents and the form of future war. And I think that's been a key component of today. It struck me that um, his reminder to us um, is not to try and do that. And um, if I was looking for further reassurance, Patrick Porter's um, brilliant articulation today of uh, don't just try and define a view of the history of war by saying uh, we just have to get better at predicting it and reacting to it in future, um, that's probably not possible and probably not hugely productive. So instead of trying to predict the incidence and the form of future conflicts, maybe it's better to consider the context of the maritime environment of 2035, a context that will hopefully provide the setting in which future naval warfare may be conducted. So that's what I'll try and do. We've heard today already the, the well-established importance of seaborne trade, which dominates our country's economy today and shows every prospect of doing so out into the future. And not just for us, but for all maritime nations. 90% of intercontinental and regional trade by volume, with an estimated global value of $4 trillion a year. By 2045, it's estimated that Asia will account for 75% of global consumers. And this shift in the customer base to that region, I think, will only serve to increase our reliance on seaborne trade. Furthermore, by the middle of this century, uh, we think 70% of the world's population will be concentrated in cities, and most of those cities are on or near the coast. So this urbanised littoral environment will link to a maritime domain that is going to become more congested, more cluttered, more contested, and we've heard much of that today as well. And with a growing demand for and a dwindling supply of basic resources, this is going to lead to competition over energy, food and water, and that competition will surely play out on the seas. So these are some of the global strategic trends that define the maritime environment as we look out towards 2035. And Britain's access to the global commons that is the sea is arguably the predominant factor behind our place at the top table of the international system. It has been for hundreds of years, and I will contend it still is today. And as we look forward, that global commons will continue to provide the same opportunities, both for access and for freedom of manoeuvre that has so long assured our national prosperity and our national security. But challenges in that area abound. And while the seas are governed broadly by international law and conventional norms, for the most part, the adherence to those laws is reliant on common consent. It's hard to police them everywhere on the world's seas. The sheer size of those oceans and seas makes policing them near impossible. And whilst further regulation would probably risk constraining our own freedom of manoeuvre on which our trade relies, we must therefore accept that the sea is going to be increasingly an environment open to exploitation. Again, Patrick Porter's brilliant phrase, competitive multipolarity. Our interests are not just restricted, of course, to activity on the seas either, but also under the sea, just as vital for our prosperity and our security. And then information, the new global resource, the new global commons. Um, we're going to operate in an increasingly information-dominated battle space. It's no longer just the enabler to warfare it used to be. It's now a fully-fledged national lever of power in its own right. And I've got a new word to describe it today, um, thanks to Mayor, informationization. I hadn't heard that before, but I'll lock it away. We are increasingly connected Information and the internet pervades every aspect of our life, fiscal, social, and cultural. 
And as I reflected back on um, a previous event here at Rusi earlier this week, the space conference, where my Royal Air Force counterpart, Steve Hillier, focused quite rightly on the intensifying threats to the satellite network on which we depend, which could also impact on our life. It's hard not to conclude that we are looking at a challenge from satellite to seabed. And when it comes to the flow of information, 97% of data transfer occurs now, not by satellite, but by underwater cables. And should that underwater network be compromised in any way, it's assessed that the satellite networks would only have sufficient bandwidth for about 7% of what currently passes on those cables. So that international infrastructure is as vulnerable as it is critical. Commercially available unmanned underwater vehicles can already now locate, photograph and survey those undersea cables. And if this is the case, how easily could it be to disrupt the digital network or compromise it with a bespoke military capability that can get at it? Many of you will know the existence of the Russian ocean reconnaissance ship Yantar. It spent much of the last six months um, heroic uh, and very demanding work looking for the lost Argentinian submarine in the South Atlantic and now in the Eastern Mediterranean, searching for their downed fighter aircraft. But it op often operates um, on our continental seabed and it often switches off AIS when it's doing so. And we know it has the capacity to get at those cables. And also Russian submarines, which are often reported through open source as lurking in the vicinity of the underwater cables with an assessed capability to also influence them. Now, my fellow service chiefs have spoken on several occasions in the last six months about the nature of the Russian threat. Here at Rusi a few months ago, um, General Sir Nick Carter, the Chief of the General Staff, and in just over two weeks' time, the new Chief of the Defence Staff, presented a very clear perspective of the Russian threat through a land prism. And I fully agree and support his assessment, um, but clearly you'd expect me to make a corresponding maritime focus today. If you look at Europe from the perspective of Moscow, you would see a peninsula and you'd see vulnerable maritime flanks for yourself from which Europe can threaten you, but also vulnerable maritime flanks in Europe that you can exploit. Indeed, it can be no coincidence that the Russian four strategic zones which the CGS described, the West, the Arctic, the Black Sea and the Far East, um, are pretty much delineated by the bodies of water that they lie adjacent to. And in operational terms, we've seen Russia exploit in Syria um, a valuable proving ground for weapons, tactics, and procedures, and given their current and future commanders critical operational experience in that theater. And this has been prevalent in the way they have colonized the Eastern Mediterranean, the Black and the Caspian Seas. Some might regard, for example, the deployment of the Kuznetsov carrier um, a failure. Everyone remembers the photographs of the smoke belching from the funnel. Jets being disembarked on arrival into Syria and even two of them being lost during carrier ops in the Eastern Med. Um, but knowing what they do, um, I'm pretty sure they will have learned some hard lessons from that. Um, they will have thought long and hard about the message of presence and posture that that deployment brought. And my, my sense is they'll do it better next time. They learn rapidly. And their proving of the capability to fire caliber cruise missiles from ships in the Caspian Sea to targets in Syria is a groundbreaking moment of the way maritime operations can influence the land. And when you then combine that with a tenfold increase in activity in the North Atlantic, as the Secretary of State mentioned this morning, particularly in the subsurface environment, the inescapable conclusion is that we're facing significantly emboldened Russian naval activity, which is continually testing our resolve. Perhaps even more challenging is the Russian methodology they employ, hybrid, ambiguous, deliberate, giving the advantage of having the initiative, and you heard that so powerfully articulated by our Ukrainian friend this morning. It means that whilst an assessment of their military capability is increasingly able to be made, an assessment of their intent is, as always, far harder, and that only serves to heighten the risk of miscalculation. 
And that's why, alongside so many of the key allies here today, we're protecting our own backyard in the North Atlantic as a pivotal national task, because failure to do so will define our national security situation for decades to come. And ours is going to be a joined up response with our allies. NATO has for so long been the cornerstone of our national defense. And that is being bolstered uh, in our ability to protect those areas, not least by the recently reconstituted US Second Fleet. It's right in the grain of that thinking. So be in no doubt, the Royal Navy has no intention of playing merely um, a standby bit part in this work. We will be in the vanguard of this work. And by setting out our stall now, by clearly demonstrating our resolve to defend our interests and uphold the international rule-based system, we will set the conditions for the future. And that's a future that can, if we are canny, hold right the way out to 2035. And that's why I concentrate on it now. As we consider the challenge within the context of that future operating environment, I think rarely has it been more important that we do so. The growing importance of the high north over the coming decades, both for indigenous resource and also for trade routes, presents new opportunities. But those opportunities will also open up new areas for competition, and Admiral Niels knows all about that. Without an established rules-based framework to define our approach to that new environment, the potential for escalation there is all too real. But the North Atlantic is not just going to be the limit of our future focus. Many other threats that we face in that joint operating area are deepening, of course, but they're broadening too. And much of the activity that we're engaged in today across the world's oceans, I think, will serve as an indicator of what we can expect to be involved in in the future. Migrants crossing the Mediterranean to Europe um, to escape instability uh, is probably going to be with us for some time yet. The presence of strategic choke points threatened by proxy wars in the Middle East, the Houthis in Yemen at the moment threatening the Straits of Bab al-Mandeb, are not going to go away. And the potential for state-on-state -state competition in the South China Sea. None of these direct pointers to the future character of naval warfare um, are pointing at conflict in their own right, but they're pointing to contested and congested waters but they do demonstrate an emergent trend. All of them are manifestations of global competition and the potential for the breakdown of a rules-based system. Non-state players are ever more present in the maritime domain. We've touched on that on many occasions today, and they're empowered by the freedom of weapons proliferation, which is arming them. The resultant surge of investment by nations around the world in their navies as a counter to that is only going to serve to increase congestion on and above the waters. And of course, nowhere is that rapid expansion of naval power more evident than in China, and we've touched on that in detail this week, uh, the, today. Only last week, their first domestically built 50,000 ton aircraft carrier put to sea for trials, a powerful embodiment of their global ambition. And in five years' time, I think it's reasonable to expect that wherever we are operating in the world, the Chinese will be there too. We, we touched on that this morning. And in 10 years' time, we think the Chinese submarine fleet will be larger than that of the United States Navy. Now, this creates an interesting bilateral dynamic for us as a nation. We need to both strike a balance between our relationship with China as a valued trade partner, particularly valuable in the wake of Brexit, uh, and yet also evaluate our relationship with them as a potentially capable naval power, which is not going to pose a direct threat to our activity, but our influence on behalf of global Britain could well see them contest our ability to do freedom of navigation operations, the pivotal maritime component of a rules-based international system. I have the great honor and privilege to have been invited by my counterpart, Chief of the PLA Navy, to visit China next month, and I look forward to exploring that evolution under probably quite robust discussions, but I welcome it. It's a real privilege to be going. And if we consider this context, the backdrop that will define our operations in the decades to come, one thing to me is clear. The responsibility for our national deterrent, vested in the Royal Navy, both nuclear and conventional, 
overlaid on top of our continuing mission to secure our sea lines of communication and our critical national infrastructure, we'll need to draw on credible military capability with sufficient versatility to face the full spectrum of the threats that we face and sufficient strength to win in a peer-on-peer -peer contest should that be required, almost certainly in conjunction with allies and partners. And that response, of course, starts with the new Queen Elizabeth-class carriers, which will soon sit at the head of a globally deployable balanced fleet, a fleet that comprises a self-contained force capable of operating under and on the water, in the air, from the sea to the land, and with partners and allies too in space and in cyberspace, a fleet that's going to carry the heart of the nation's expeditionary strike capability, the F-35 Lightning Jet, around which the carriers are designed, but also carrying the Royal Marine Commandos, the only land force capable of credible, high-tempo, high-readiness intervention from the sea in all environments and in arduous conditions. A fleet that will bring uh, a world-beating suite of capabilities, sensors and weapons like the radars in our Type 45 destroyers, the new Sea Scepter missiles in our frigates that have just been declared in service today, as you've heard. And as I highlighted earlier in my comments in the, in the panel, the platforms that we're building now will be pretty much the ones that we will be operating in 2035. So we have to future-proof that fleet. Nothing short of full digitization of our service will be sufficient as we head towards a new era of machine speed warfare. Our new ships, submarines and aircraft are all designed to be cutting edge from the outset, but we, we must continue to explore new and evolving technologies to keep them in that place throughout their time in service. Capabilities like unmanned mine countermeasures vessels and unmanned rotorcraft open architecture command systems, high energy weapon systems, all of these will complement and enhance our ship's warfighting capabilities in response to new and evolving threats. And we have to have the capacity to bring all of that in with the current fleet. And innovation is gonna be the key to do that. The Royal Navy's got a strong pedigree in this area that I'm proud of, but we constantly need to challenge ourselves to do more. It's the focus of significant investment already with dedicated technical accelerators in the fields of cyber, artificial intelligence, information warfare, and unmanned air, surface, and underwater vehicles. But technology alone will not win the conflicts of the future. I had already written that before Peter Roberts said it in the panel we've just had. We need to be innovative in the how we do things, not just the what with. I think Nelson would have understood that, and we still take our tempo from him. So as much as the future fleet will be increasingly automated, so too it will continue to be reliant on the best of people to do the things that only people can do. And I'm so glad our panel touched on that too. The values that have defined our service for centuries, we, we define them now as courage, commitment, loyalty, integrity, discipline and respect, C2 drill as we drum into our sailors and marines, will be the watchwords of a new generation. The millennials who've grown up in the digital era, era, young men and women with that innate freedom of thought to innovate and adapt in this modern high-tech world, we have to get our fair share of them to make that Navy a reality. And in this continental future, we'll continue to operate closely with allies, and that demands the compromises of interoperability, both in equipment, but also through a better understanding of each other, so that we can continue to both build and lead existing alliances through active engagement as we're doing right now with NATO forces in the Eastern Mediterranean. So as I conclude, there's no question that in the decades to come, the character of naval warfare is going to continue to evolve, perhaps at a greater pace than we've seen before. But I'd like to return to another theme of Lawrence Friedman's book as I close. As much as the pace of technological change may define the future character of conflict, as he recognized, so too is the future of warfare also going to be shaped by many elements of continuity. Not everything will change, and working out which is which will be key. 
In 2035, there's little doubt in my mind that the security and prosperity of this island nation will still rest upon our access to and our freedom of manoeuvre on the global commons that is the sea. So we must protect our vital sea lines of communication. We must protect our vital national offshore and underwater infrastructure. We must protect our natural maritime resources. And we must deter all those who would threaten our interests and seek to compromise the rules which govern that global commons, which are of such vital consequence to our nation's future. We've got to continue building the alliances, working with the partners, seeking the common good that will enable our national influence to be exerted around the world on behalf of our vision of a global Britain. And in the decades to come, in keeping with half a millennium of tradition, I'm convinced that that's what the Royal Navy will do. Thank you.